rainforests of Brazil. Two thousand years ago in South America, forest Indians came to hunt by the edge of a remote creek. The waters of the creek were, remarkably, crystal clear. The Indians believed that an ancient spirit lived in the waters and that the spirit protected them and also the creatures that shared their world. To these people, the creek possessed magic powers and the name they gave it survives to this day. In the north of Brazil, where the River Negro and the mighty Amazon meet, virgin rainforest still stretches for over 300 miles. This is the green hell of Victorian explorers. Many who ventured here simply disappeared. Not even their bones were found. Those lucky few who returned alive told tales of a mysterious and powerful animal. The Indians called it Onza, and it was all that was dark and unknown in the forest. Now, the Onza has another name, Jaguar. The Jaguar has the most powerful bite of all the big cats, and its silent and solitary nature means it is still the most potent spirit of the forest's shadows. The Jaguar is well adapted to this place. Unique among the great cats, it is completely at home in water. A tracker jar terrapin is a favorite meal, but many of these freshwater turtles escape because even with its great jaws, the cat cannot always break through the armored shell. 30 years ago, organized hunting of jaguars for their skins penetrated even these remote fastnesses. The nomadic Indians have moved on, but man has settled here. Carlitos has fathered 11 children. Seven have died and lie in the little graveyard beside the creek. But this family clings on in one of the most unwelcoming environments on earth. These people are caboclos, descendants of early Portuguese settlers who intermarried with the Indians. They made their home in this place remote even by Brazilian standards, for the same reason that the Indians visited here, the clear waters, rich in fish, which provide almost all the family's meager diet. It's the unusual clarity of the water in a land of coffee-colored rivers, which made the Indians think this place of streams and misty forest was heavy with magic. Carlitos is passing on his accumulated knowledge to his son, Francisco. All his knowledge, 
except how to trap and catch the now protected creatures of Amazonia. The bright feathers of macaws were once used in the dance rituals of the forest Indians. They're good to eat too, but Carlitos never hunts them. The bizarre Matamata turtle spends all its life in the water. Finding it on land means there is a change coming. They only come out of the water to breed. The ten-year-old Francisco, being able to read the sounds and sights here, could one day make the difference between life and death. The forest provides important additional food for a family always on the edge of hunger. This husk contains the seeds of the castagna tree. It takes many blows with a machete to split the rock-hard shell. We know them as Brazil nuts. Rich in protein and oils, they are a welcome seasonal boost to their diet. Tarde. Only one or two have fallen. Carlitos must gather them quickly. There are others in this forest who await the Brazil nut's arrival on the ground. The Akuchi has specialized teeth for gnawing through the hard coverings of the seeds. This little rodent plays an important role here because like a squirrel, it stores food underground. It will return and eat some of the buried seeds, but it forgets where some are hidden, and those may germinate and become the next generation of Brazil nut trees. The Akuchi takes care to cover the store. There may be robbers about, but the Akuchi itself is in more danger than the hidden nuts. The Akuchi must use all its senses because the jaguar's intricate pattern of spots makes it almost invisible in the dappled shade. It's this coat that made it so attractive to the fur trade and still the victim of poachers today. The jaguar is never far from water throughout its territory, which can cover an area of over 100 square miles. The trails that Carlitos uses are also used by jaguars and the animals they prey on.
Fallen trees are crossing places for those who live in the river forest and good scratching sites for jaguars. A big cat has passed this way not long ago. Francisco has heard many tales about the Onza. Like all forest people, he will fear the jaguar all his life. But it's a fear lodged in myth and in the jaguar's invisibility and great strength. The cats seldom attack people. Turtles are food for people and jaguars. Like all reptiles, they must risk exposure to bask in the vital warmth from the few rays of sun which penetrate the dense canopy overhead. The urgency is great and tempers get frayed, just as in any traffic jam. It's a continual process. Soon they return to the water to cool down again. Cooling down or quenching thirst in the river forest is a matter of risk and knowledge. Some of the lianas, which snake down from the trees, contain a deadly poison which the Indians use for their blow darts. Others may not kill, but they cause severe sickness. The right liana contains a seemingly endless supply of fresh drinking water. The jaguar undi cannot bite open a water-filled creeper. It has to lick the dew from a leaf. This forest cat shares the same territory as the jaguar, but they don't compete. The jaguar undi is smaller and lighter and tackles different prey. Unlike the jaguar, the jaguar undi has never been hunted. Its sleek grey pelt does not have the fashion appeal of the jaguar's glorious coat. Like all cats, its scent marks its territory. The jaguar undi is also known as the otter cat because of the shape of its head and that long sinuous body. But the otter it resembles is very different from the small mammals of the old world, streams and rivers. The Brazilian giant otter is the size of a very large dog and one of its favourite snacks is piranha. Of all the animals of the river forest, the giant otter was the one pushed closest to extinction by fur hunters. Now, like the jaguar, it's making a comeback Carlitos used to kill them for their skins. He hasn't shot one for 20 years. The otter's bold and inquisitive nature once made them easy targets. The otters have excavated breeding dens in the bank. If they are prepared to risk raising a family here, that's clear evidence that they regard these waters as safe once more. This female has one youngster, about six months old. Leaving the den, the time they are most exposed and at risk, the otters are always cautious and silent. The mother still has to encourage the young one to join her in the creek. Although they appear to be creatures whose spirit is wholly of the rivers and streams, young otters need to be taught to swim and be at home in water. This cub still feels safer in the den than in this strange new world he was born to master. When they are not fishing or resting, otters are inevitably playing, a privilege only enjoyed by animals which do not have to spend all their time searching for food. At twice the length of its largest relative, a fully grown giant otter can measure over seven feet and weigh over 60 pounds. They can kill a man, and they have. Unlike the forest cats, 
the otters are only active during the day. In a clear creek, they hunt underwater by sight. These rich waters provide plenty. The mother otter won't share her fish. Her cub is at an age when he must learn to catch his own supper or starve. But at the moment, fish is still more fun than food for the youngster. He will eventually learn that there are bigger things than fish lurking in these magic waters. And they, like him, are survivors from the dark days of the skin trade. Carlitos must fish every day to feed his family. So must the Anhinga, at first motionless as it peers beneath the silver surface, and then like a spear as it launches itself at a fish. These magic waters are just as rich in life as the forests that surround them. It's part of our mythology that cats hate water. Well, some do, but the jaguar is perfectly at home here. A languorous scratch on a fallen tree helps mark his territory. It's also an opportunity to check the creek for a meal. A jaguar could cope with even this 50 pound expanser turtle. He's quite capable of swimming against a strong current or crossing wide rivers in hot pursuit. But the turtle can dive to the bottom. The jaguar must remain on the surface, hoping for a sighting when the expanse leaves the water. There's an urgency lending speed to the turtle's flight. And despite the jaguar's powerful rhythmic pursuit, the turtle can easily outpace him. It's September, and at this time every year, the turtles must leave the relative safety of the hidden creeks and head for the main river, the Rio Branco, to breed on the sandbanks where they were born. This warden is here to guard against human predators who come to harvest the turtles when they are at their most vulnerable. It's too late to save this one, which bears the unmistakable marks of a jaguar's powerful jaws.
The migrating turtles gather when the falling river exposes more and more sand. They pass the first month in the water close to the beach and come out to bask in the sun for a short time each day. The egg-laying cycle of the turtles is closely linked to seasonal changes in the water level. Getting it wrong could be disastrous. Rivers are highways in Amazonia, which means they are often used by highway robbers, pirates of the creeks. The surface temperature of the sand can reach over 60 degrees Celsius. When the skimmer begins to incubate its eggs, it spends hours sitting under the shadeless equatorial sun. The only way the bird can lose heat is by panting. The main problem is not to warm the eggs, but to keep them cool. The birds take it in turns to fill specialized breast feathers with river water. The cool feathers then help lower the temperature of the eggs beneath. Until the eggs hatch, the skimmers continue to mate. It seems they need to keep reinforcing their relationship, as it takes two to ensure any chance of breeding success in this exposed and baking place. By late afternoon, the heat eases off. The inhabitants of the river forest prepare for the night. Those that have passed the day searching for food can rest. For the turtles, this is the chosen night. It's now about four weeks since the expanses arrived at the sandbank. Some mysterious conjunction of temperature and water level tells them the time is right to lay their eggs. But it is a dangerous time. During the two hours she's out of the water, she's at her most vulnerable. She excavates a nest over three feet deep, and in it she will lay up to 130 soft round eggs. She must be finished before the dawn's light leaves her even more exposed. She uses her powerful feet to fill in the nest and all of her 50 pound frame to pack the sand down. The females come onto the nesting grounds in groups of about 10. Sometimes a turtle will uncover an earlier nest. Although the eggs that are buried below the surface are safe from predators, those that are unearthed by accident are discovered at first light. The vultures waste no time and gorge greedily. If her eggs survive, they will hatch in about 48 days.
The annual rains can be a major threat to the turtle eggs deep in the sand. This year they are early and the entire nesting grounds could be flooded and the eggs will be lost. Most creatures are affected by the rains. The skimmers have been caught out. They've nested on a sandbank, which will be completely covered by the rising waters. They will lose their eggs. The arrival of the rains will change the lives of every living thing in the river and the forest. At the height of the wet season, the Amazon basin contains one-fifth of all fresh water on Earth. For Carlitos and his family, life is harder after the rains. The fish he used to find in the creeks have spread out amongst the flooded trees to spawn. The stingray is not considered worth eating, but it can be dangerous. Carlitos warns Francisco of the painful weapon hidden in its tail. Step on it, and this fish will whip a sharp, venomous barb into the offending, usually bare foot. Their world has changed dramatically. Where they once walked on the leaf litter of the forest floor, they now paddle. The waters have risen over 30 feet in 12 weeks. It is not just birds that lay eggs on the sandbanks that can lose them in the rains. These ghostly shapes are flooded nests. Once they were 20 feet above the ground. This was a colony of caciques, and of course, all the eggs and young have perished. However, the caciques, like many other creatures, have learnt to adapt. It is not the first time that this has happened, and it won't be the last. They are rebuilding the whole colony at the very top of the tree in a branch just clear of the surface. The females weave their nests out of fibres taken from forest palms. It is a long and intricate process. Kakik society seems to be organised by the males, or at least they do all the shouting. The male displays are both vocal and visual. Getting his feathers ruffled seems to encourage the females to work hard with the promise of his company when she has finished. Caciques build their colonies around wasps' nests for protection. Any disturbance or attempt by a predator to get at the eggs or young would also disturb the wasps or would attack the intruder.
Getting about in this flooded world becomes more difficult for everyone, man and beast alike. Toad sloth is perhaps the strangest of all the animals in Amazonia. Renowned for their slowness of movement, sloths are surprisingly competent swimmers. Her baby, less than a month old, quickly learns to move from breast to back. has a cast iron digestive system. It lives on leaves, which few other creatures find palatable. But sloths do like their leaves to be young and fresh, and to find new leaves in the flooded forest they must take to the water. Everything in the river forest depends for its survival on the ability to cope and find food in changed conditions. Young Francisco has been nicknamed Arirania by his family. It is Portuguese for giant otter. This is a compliment to his developing talent for fishing. He enjoys fishing, but he knows it's not for fun, but for survival. The family cannot afford to lose a lure snagged on a submerged tree. After the rains, aquatic plants and grasses flourish. This attracts one of the rarest and most primitive creatures to the magic waters. The mysterious disappearance of a water lettuce is the first clue to its arrival. With the jaguar and the giant otter, the Amazonian manatee is the third creature of the river forest to come back from the edge of extinction. But it remains extremely rare. During the flooded season, these great beasts come here to feed on the lush new growth. Little is known about this gentle, rather mournful mammal. This is the first time they have been filmed. The manatee does everything very slowly. And this is the main reason why it can dive so well. Manatees can stay underwater for up to 20 minutes. A manatee reaches sexual maturity sometime between 5 and 10 years of age. And after a pregnancy of 12 to 14 months, a female gives birth to its solitary calf.
This baby is feeding herself now, but she's still sticking close to her mother. She may stay with her for more than two years. Although the manatee is not especially social, they do group together in feeding areas when the forest is flooded. For over 400 years, the Amazonian manatee was hunted. In the first half of this century, it was killed for its extremely tough hide. This was used for making drive belts for machinery all over the world until the Brazilian government declared it an endangered species in 1973. They are entirely vegetarian and eat up to 8% of their body weight each day. And an adult may weigh over 1,000 pounds. Because of the bulk of food they must consume, they are active both during the day and at night. They can't see very well with those tiny eyes, and those flippers are actually forearms with a hand bone structure still intact inside a covering of skin. The high water might be an advantage to the manatees, but it makes life generally harder for terrestrial animals. So much of the forest is flooded that movement is much more restricted. This leads to some surprise encounters on the few dry tracks. The tegu is the largest ground living lizard in South America. The tegu is aggressive, has powerful teeth and a fearsome bite. The jaguarundi would certainly kill and eat a small tegu. But it's trying to bite off more than it can possibly chew with this almost fully grown lizard. The cat moves on to hunt for easier prey. And on the sandbanks, the tegu discovers its favorite meal. On the sandbanks of the Rio Branco, an uncovered turtle's nest attracts the tegu. The exposed eggs are a bonus. The lizard can detect most turtle nests below the sand, but the giant expanser lays her eggs too deep for the reptile to pick up the scent. The skimmers have nested again. This time, they have been successful. The young separate from their parents soon after hatching and make their own practice scrapes in the sand. From this early age, they can fend for themselves and at once see each other as rivals. If one moves too close, it provokes an immediate reaction from its sibling. Many young birds depend totally on their parents until they are ready to leave the nest. But skimmer chicks must develop all their senses rapidly. On the exposed sandbanks, they run the risk of falling victim to predators, such as the tegu. Until they are fully fledged, the two halves of the young skimmer's beak are of equal length. So they are able to pick up and feed on small insects and crustaceans. Like the sandling, which also feeds along the river's edge.
A mole cricket, forced out of its burrow by the rising waters, makes a good meal for the collared plover. It is only when the young skimmers fledge that their lower beak suddenly grows to enable them to skim the water for fish like their parents. Higher up the bank, there is movement in the sands. The expanse's eggs have at last begun to hatch. It's a long and exhausting process for these tiny reptiles. They may remain buried in the sand for a further two weeks, living off their yolk sacs. They will all emerge together, hopefully at night. By dawn, there is an atmosphere of urgency. They must reach the water quickly. The last ones to appear are always the most at risk, especially those few that head off in the wrong direction. On the sandbanks, black caracaras and vultures wait for the hatchlings, but this is not the wholesale slaughter suffered by their cousins, the sea turtles. Vultures are normally carrion eaters, but here on these nesting grounds, they have watched the caracaras and have learned to take live prey. Of the thousands that hatch, most make it to the river, but it is here where they will fall victim to piranha, caiman, and other more familiar predators. These men are protectors, not predators.
The Brazilian government have organized a small force to protect the turtles. It is a dangerous job because anyone caught taking these turtles faces a five-year prison sentence and confiscation of their boat. Rather than lose their livelihood, fishermen sometimes try to shoot their way out of it. They question the head of the family. He says he doesn't know it's a protected area. But the officer senses guilt. There are few hiding places on such a small boat. And it doesn't take long to find the evidence. The sack contains turtle hatchlings and they're still alive. The fisherman is a worried man, but this time he escapes with a warning. These officers are really after the bigger commercial boats who smuggle adult turtles to the illegal meat markets in the Amazonian city of Manaus. These young turtles will disperse into the smaller rivers and creeks, but some never return to the sanctuary of the magic waters. Northern Amazonia is so vast that there are places where the rainforest, so damaged elsewhere, still seems to go on forever. Life here is difficult enough in the dry season, but almost impossible when the forest is flooded. And it is this inaccessibility which helps protect the area and the wildlife that has found refuge here. The return of creatures that were once faced with extinction is the most visible sign that an essential balance is being restored. Perhaps the river god the old Indians revered continues to watch over their forest world and the creatures of these magic waters. A double CD, Survivals, the Music of Nature, containing a selection of music from survival programs, is available in all major record shops.
there's a colour brochure accompanying this survival special. If you'd like a copy, please send an A4 stamped addressed envelope, clearly stating the programme title, to Survival Brochure, Anglia Television, Norwich, NR1, 3JG.